Hi guys, it's Sophie. So I'm going to be sharing um, some book recommendations today. This is something that you guys requested, actually I think a few people have requested it, um, and it's one I'm really excited to make. I kind of felt like I needed more books to do this with, but actually I'm going to do them with, with the ones I have, um, and it's something I'm hoping to read more and more about going forward, um, so you might see more books on this topic um, going through my videos if it's something you're interested in and maybe this is uh, your introduction to this channel. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some books relating to climate change um, or kind of more generally um, human-made ecological change. Um, today I have a few and hopefully you'll get um, something from this. I really loved reading more about this. I feel like I'm a lot more informed than I was um, and I also feel like it's something I want other people to read about. The first one I'm going to recommend is a really good like starter book I think and that's This Is Not A Drill by Extinction Rebellion. Um, this is quite well known, you guys probably know who Extinction Rebellion are, I don't agree with everything that they do, um, but they are a group um, that is does not have a central leadership that hopes to um, put forward the idea that climate change is an emergency, that it is something that we need to react to right now. Um, and this book talks about the things that you can do alongside some of the impacts um, of climate change kind of across the globe. Um, I don't think that you need to agree with everything they say to read this and get something from it. Um, so this might be one sort of for the politically active but not yet fully immersed into climate change conversation. The next one is one that I think is really valuable with a caveat. So it's The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. The caveat is that, um, as you may know, not all non-fiction books are checked factually. Um, they can be published as non-fiction. The publishing house doesn't do that bit of the job. Um, and I, I think that a lot of the messages here are brilliant. Um, however, some of the numbers that he's used in the timescales, um, people working in climate science have said it probably wouldn't be that fast. Um, so just so you know, that some of the kind of mathsy statistical bits in here that he's drawing from maybe aren't exactly what climate change scientists are saying now. But what what the uninhabitable earth does, and why I would still recommend it, is it paints a picture of what the earth would look like at different degrees of warming and what it would take to reduce warming um, sort of by that level, what action would be needed. Um, and I think it reads a bit like a horror story. I don't think you can sit down and read it in one go. I think you need to read a section of it and then weep and cry in the corner. But um, it's one of those things where it feels almost entirely unreal, um, but you know that there's ev there is evidence behind um, the kinds of things that he's describing. And it's almost as though your world is changing in, in a way that is totally unrecognisable to anything you've grown up with. And that's something that humans experience all the time, but rarely like in a lifespan. Um, and I think this is probably one for people who've read a bit more about um, climate change, but want to want that kind of forward view, want to feel a little bit of that fear, um, which I do think is actually quite important. Um, and yeah, kind of imagine what the world could be like if we don't do anything. I think this is a kind of subtle call to action, um, but one to put a bit of the fear back in. I think we often try and push away everything that frightens us um, without seeing it as being um, an emotion that tells us that that's something we value and don't want to lose. Um, so there's The Unhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. Then next for something a little more hopeful, I have Wilding by Isabella Tree. This was one of my favourite books I've read on the subject of like climate change this year. It's one of the ones that is much more hopeful. Um, it follows a couple who were sort of traditional farmers in the UK. Um, I think they had both. I think they had both cattle and crops, um, and they've been kind of doing this um, intensive farming on this land for a long period of time. Their financial situation changed. They had the opportunity to either drop the farm or think of something new, and they decided to let the farm go, as in stop fiddling with it but keep owning it and let the land do what it does um, and they did then go through the process of introducing some creatures which reflected what the UK might have looked like um, before humans started this widespread farming just to see what happens and the impacts of that were amazing um, it just becomes this kind of species rich like oasis um, with birds and bees and moths and all sorts that 
haven't been seen in the UK or seem to be extinct in the UK, they just start showing up. This is one of those books that if you feel a little bit downtrodden by it and you think there's nothing that we can do, that it feels almost like a runaway train. I think Wilding's really nice to show that actually what you need to do sometimes isn't even that hard. Um, and this is obviously quite a specific example. I don't want to go too much into it because this is a book recommendation video. Um, but we all know that our individual action is something that um, will not be balanced out um, in terms of the huge corporations that produce the majority of the, the, carbon, monoxide, the carbon dioxide, the majority of, of global warming, the majority of energy consumption. We know this. Um, however, I do think that individual action is helpful in that it makes you mindful through, the, through your life. It makes you think where you spend your money, it makes you think the way that you vote, it makes you think the way that you talk to other people and what you advocate for. Um, so I don't want to downplay individual action or small scale action like Wilding um, just because of the fact that there is this huge monolith of a problem. Um, we need to do other action through that and advocate that our government takes action um, to change that but I don't want to disempower people from being able to do things and act in line with their values in their own life because I think that's something that exercise has value in itself. The next one I have is one I didn't love as much, but I think I just wasn't as into this particular topic. Um, that is Clearing the Air by Tim Smedley. This is a book about air pollution. Um, I have been lucky that throughout my entire life I have lived in a place that has very good air like, quality. Uh, I've always lived in a really rural place, excusing like a year and a bit um, in cities. Um, this has never felt like a problem in my life. I don't think other than going to London on a day trip in that horrible moment where you blow your nose and everything's black, which is absolutely terrifying to me, um, <laughs> that I've really had a lot of experience with this firsthand, and I think maybe that's my own um, bias, meaning I don't, I didn't feel connected with this so much. Um, but it's talking about air pollution worldwide, how it's produced, how it is similar to climate change but not necessarily linked to climate change, and what the health consequences are. I think if you live somewhere that is more built up you will, this will scare you, but it might also make you kind of aware of something um, more than you were. This guy carries a little egg that measures air pollution around with him and tests it throughout his, his life. So going on the tube and walking down a busy street versus being in a park and just sees how your life is built up in these kind of risk factors just made by the concentration of people and economy in, in a space. Um, so yes, I think other people may well enjoy this more than I did. Climate change in terms of global warming is probably more my bag right now than air pollution, but I can see how the two interlink entirely. The next one is for people who've dived into where we are at the minute but want to know how we got here. This is The Decade We Could Have Stopped Climate Change by Nathaniel Rich. This is the history of climate change that I think everybody needs to know about. I cannot believe that I didn't know anything about this. Um, this is talking about the original scientists who came and said this is a problem in like the 60s and 70s and brought it to everyone's attention with ways that this with the situation we're in now could have been avoided and how that just didn't happen and the political reasons why that didn't happen and how climate change was this huge scientific concern which didn't get the governmental support and just dropped back down into the public's you know lower levels of knowledge until it came back up again, until we got to the point we are now, where we're in this kind of waterfall state. I thought this was absolutely fascinating and it makes me sad for the scientists. Um, that's kind of my primary emotion is to work so hard and to know what to do and not to be allowed to do it. And I know that's still kind of where we are now. Um, but I think this one is such a good one if you're reading the kind of books I've talked about already or you're following the news and you don't quite know like how the whole story links up, read this one, it's so good. And then the last book I have to share is probably the one that's had the best personal impact and that is Turning the Tide from Plastic by Lucy Siegel. I have seen in my own life and in the lives of those around me such a change in terms of the way we think about our waste, the way we think about consumption, the tiny village that I live in that like won't show up on your like mats, you know what I mean? Like you wouldn't even know I was here. Now has um, an eco supermarket that looks to recycle, um, like hard to recycle goods in the area so they don't have to go to landfill. We have a vegan market which is just starting. Um, 
and um, sellers in this in like town are selling sustainable goods. And I want to also caveat that by saying the place I live isn't like a really wealthy enclave in in um, the southwest. It really isn't. There's a lot of people who really struggle here. Um, and to be honest, like most of our town has like shut shops. It's not a, a mecca of all oh, lovely vegan markets. That that's not what I expected. I grew up here. I've lived here for. 18 years of my life and come all the way back again and I feel like I know this place so well and it feels so hopeful that, that kind of thing's happening here. Um, it's the same as like pride happened here, that was something that happened in cities, that was something that could never happen in a town anywhere near me. Um, it almost felt like that was for the people who lived in cities and then we had like the same butchers for 400 years which is lovely. Um, Anyway, so I think lots of people are thinking about waste and consumption. Um, this book made me go and take action immediately. I went and did a beach clear up as soon as I'd finished this. And every single day since I've read it, I think about the content of this book. Um, it's just talking about the way that plastic interacts with our lives and what it does and the way it interacts with global warming again. But this one just struck me so hard. Um, and I think it's fantastic that I feel like there's more of a cultural shift to acknowledge this element. Um, and it makes me hopeful that we can start to address some of the others. So that's been quite a long video for not very many books, but hopefully you found something you might enjoy. I'll see you guys again soon in my next video and drop me a comment down below if you have any other climate change recommendations. See you soon. Bye.